He's up to something. All right, then, keep your secrets. Good. But I know you have something to do with it. Good gracious, man. Hey, buddy, watch this. Gandalf and Secrets, the perfect way to open this latest custom card review with Lord of the Rings themed cards, including this one from Synth and Lasers, which features Gandalf and is a secret for Mage. It reads, when a friendly minion is attacked, give it immune until the end of your next turn. So um, you play this, you got a minion on board, let's just say it's uh, a 1-1. One, one. Your opponent trades into that 1-1. One, one. Well, no, they don't. It's immune instead. It survives. And then the next turn, when you get your attack back, then you'll be able to attack with it again. So if it's a 1-1, one, one, not very exciting. If it's an 8-8, eight, eight, on the other hand, that could be amazing, taking essentially two great value trades over your opponent's stuff. Alternatively, it could just be a, something that you really desperately want to keep alive. Think about like an Emperor Thorison. Maybe you want to get multiple ticks off that Thorison. You want it to live for multiple turns, so you play You Shall Not Pass with it. Now, keep in mind a couple things. Immune cards can still be destroyed. Even if they can't take damage, they can still be taken out of the board. So it's not like this is um, a completely foolproof plan. Beyond that, uh, you can't give taunt minions immune. Well, you can, but they don't work as taunt minions anymore. That's already coded into the game. So it's not like you can create like um, this impenetrable wall of a taunt minion. It won't work that way. Your opponent could still ignore it. So a few of the problematic theories for this card are actually kind of already kept in check, I think, which makes it a really cool little secret that does something different, does something specific, captures this great last stand from Gandalf. Like all of that's really well done here. So the perfect card to open this video. So next up here, let's take a look at Treebeard from Rafam's Apprentice. It is a four mana, eight, six. It, uh, it's a treant by tribe. I mean, that's sort of unnecessary, perhaps even technically wrong, but no big deal in this case. And uh, its effect is that it sleeps an additional turn. So what that means is you normally play minions down. They have to sleep the turn they're played. They don't get to interact or attack immediately outside of rush or charge. But with Treebeard, he actually sleeps for an additional turn. So it takes a long time to actually get to attack with Treebeard, but you're getting some awesome stats in the process, essentially equivalent to that four mana 7-7, seven, seven, just uh, six health and eight attack instead, same total stats. So theoretically here, you get a great minion somewhere down the road, which kind of fits Druid's game plan in a lot of ways too, right? Like they're always building for the future. Now your opponent can decide to deal with your tree beard early if they want to, but that often means they're going to be committing more resources or more powerful resources into a four drop than they normally would, much like we saw in the past with the Flame Wreath Faceless four mana 7-7. Seven, seven. So this can create some mana advantages throughout the course of the game or just friction and big problems for your opponent down the road, which is cool which also really captures Treebeard as a sleepy, delayed tree rather nicely as well. I will say I probably would have made this card a 6-8 myself. I think giving it extra survivability kind of feels right for some reason, making your opponent commit even more to it. I wouldn't have that treant tag, but everything else about this card is really awesome. I love the way it captures the character. It's a great idea, and um, a lot of it feels good, so still very worthy of an inclusion here on this list. So next up here, let's look at the One Ring. Uh, one of the most commonly submitted cards or ideas. Some of them were, you know, token One Ring. Some are the One Ring itself. Sometimes it was minions. Sometimes it was weapons. This one from Illidan Baby Rage, I think, captured kind of the finality of the ring really well. This is a 10 mana, 0, 1 weapon. And it reads, if you burn this card, destroy the enemy hero so this is an alternate win condition card of which we've only had a couple in hearthstone uh mechathun and uther among them but uh burning this card will win you the game of course a reference to dropping the one ring in mount doom to defeat sauron etc etc in lord of the rings but uh that sounds kind of easy at first glance if you think about a card like myra's unstable element you might go wait a minute you just that's way too easy myra's will make this an instant activation and by the way this is a neutral weapon which is another thing we've never seen in hearthstone before but also seems to fit the kind of scale or epicness of the one ring so that's cool but anyway i checked myra's unstable element doesn't actually burn cards in the traditional sense when you burn a card in Hearthstone right now, it has a history bar show up. It says burned cards. 
it shows you the card, and the animation that burns the card is very fire-like. So when your hand is too full, you draw that new one, it burns up, there's fire, it goes into the history bar. When you play Myra's Unstable Element, that doesn't actually happen. Myra's, the deck, any of the remaining cards in the deck, they have this purple glow. You don't draw them all individually and burn. They all kind of dissipate in the deck, and it doesn't show up in the history bar. So I do not believe, based on that, that the One Ring would interact with Myra's Unstable Element, which means that you have to burn this card in some other way, which makes it much, much more difficult, because it has to be either totally randomly, just happening to hit it at the right time by filling your hand and drawing additional stuff, or you have to create some kind of scenario, which I think would only normally be possible at the end of the game with an empty deck, things like... I don't know, Baleful Bankers and adding cards to your hand, there are some calculations that probably make this um, doable. Now, that said, I haven't thought of any way to like totally break this and make it super obvious. I hope that doesn't exist. If there's some really, really easy way to do this, that might be a problem. If you got that idea, certainly share it in the comments below. Maybe we can all learn a thing or two. But I just love the, the flavor of this card. I think it's really cool that it's 10 mana and useless otherwise. So it's one of those things you run in your deck. It's a win condition, but it's a total risk. If you draw it early, maybe you ruin everything and you've just got a dead draw. So there's some real downsides and balance to a card like this. So in theory, really, really cool. I hope in execu execution that it would still work and still feel okay. I have some doubts, but it's just such a cool, promising idea that I'm okay to overcome those doubts. So next up here is Samwise Gamgee from Faroon. Of course, one of our beloved Hobbit friends. He's a 4-mana 2-7 neutral legendary, and he reads, Whenever this minion or your hero is healed, also restore that much health to the other. So basically what that means is Samwise Gamgee is like your best friend, because if he's taking damage and you heal him, you're going to receive the benefit of that healing as well. Alternatively, um, if you have taken damage, and so is Samwise, you can heal yourself, and Samwise will receive the benefit as well. So in either direction, everybody's friends, and we've got this really great bond, which is what I really like about this card, is because Samwise was Frodo's like best friend, and uh, did so many awesome best friend sorts of things. So capturing that bond in a card is really, really cool. And it does matter in some cases, because there are some cards that only heal minions or only heal face, and this shifts those, like Circle of Healing, for instance, can now be used to also give yourself a little bit of a face heal, which is really cool. And of course, in a class like Priest, that can go a really, really long way, doing things like completing their quest by getting extra healing. Beyond that, just a great stat line for Priest too. So although this is a neutral card, it does feel like something that could primarily be used in Priest, but who knows, there's other classes that have healing out there too, like Druid, Shaman, etc. So there might be a handful of ways to get some value out of this card otherwise, but it's just such a good way to capture that best friend in Hearthstone that I thought this card had to be included. So next up here, we have the first beacon from Rob K. And this is one of those really cool like chain style cards. We've had a handful of these in Hearthstone. I always think they're great designs. This one's a perfect fit for Lord of the Rings 2, capturing these beacon lightings that bring Gondor to save the day. You've got the first beacon, which shuffles in the second beacon. The second beacon shuffles in the third. And then finally, the third shuffles in Gondor's aid, which is this big, awesome reward that will fill your board with legendary minions and give them rush. And it's also a casts when drawn effect. So you don't even actually have to spend mana to play the Gondor's aid. It just happens automatically, which might sound amazing. Oh my God, zero mana. But also there's some downside there because if you already have minions on board, when this is drawn, you will not get a full board. You would reduce the impact of the card. So some issues there. Also, it's the sort of thing that might be really powerful to play in certain situations in the game. Maybe you want to take trades into your opponent's board. Uh, maybe you don't want to overcommit the board at certain times. But without that sort of control, you don't get to pick when to play it necessarily. That's a little bit of a risk inherent to it as well. So it's free, but there are some downsides to it. It also takes a long time to get there, and there are some conditions to meet. So you've kind of got this back and forth that feels to me like it's balancing this card really well. You do have to spend 9 mana for a very delayed effect, which might sound kind of bad in Hearthstone, but keep in mind, Warrior's a class that can often float some mana, and these beacons are the sorts of things that are kind of easy to just slide into a turn here and there. You could also maybe wait to play your third beacon until the exact right moment, hoping to increase the odds of hitting that Gondor's aid at the right point of the game, or maybe just play it as soon as possible to make sure you're hitting that big swing turn as quickly as you can. But a lot of considerations with this card, 
absolutely nailed the flavor, captured something really cool from the Lord of the Rings universe. So all in all, I think a very, very strong design. Next up here, we have March of the Ints from Sadather. And uh, we got Ints here instead of Tree Ints because this is Lord of the Rings, right? They're just Ints. This is a two-mana spell for Druid that reads, Each time you cast a spell this turn, you summon a 2-2 two -two Treant. So it's kind of like almost like a lock and load style effect. Like you spend two mana, you start casting spells, and you get bonuses. But this is bonuses that go immediately to the board. And I think this is a really cool fit for Druid, a class that... First off, likes having wide boards of stuff. It's a token style class, but also a class that's using a lot of spells to interact with those wide boards of stuff. So essentially, you can um, summon things, buff things, and you start kind of piecemealing this board together solely because of March of the Ants. So uh, maybe you play March of the Ants to kick things off. Maybe you play uh, Worthy Expedition to get an Ants on board. Then maybe you play a Power of the Wild to get you know a buff of your Ants on board. Uh, you play another Power of the Wild to buff those Ents and get another Ents on board. You play a Blessing of the Ancients to get more stuff going, right? You can start building it together, a nice little reload turn, all spawned from March of the Ents. So all in all, it just feels like a good fit for Druid that kind of takes Tree Ents in a slightly different direction and moves them in a different space, but has a lot of deck building options and just explores this in a new kind of direction while still fitting very nicely into Lord of the Rings. So that is a fantastic card in my mind. Moving on here, we have Shelob from Dilofferferg. She's a six mana two seven beast, of course, a terrifying spider in this case. And she reads at the end of your turn, summon a one two spider with poisonous. And that's Shelob spawn a two mana one two beast with poisonous. And this card at first glance kind of reminds me of like Myxna. You've got this six mana beast. It's got some poisonous stuff happening, but it's like a 10 times better design than Myxna. And the reason for that is because you're shifting the poisonous over into a smaller body that's really happy to trade, not to mention you're just getting more stats in total for six mana. So Myxna was like really slow, very awkward, incredibly hard to use. Uh, it felt weird to trade her into big minions because she would often die to the trade. With Shelob, you don't have that problem. The small minions are taking the trades. They're the ones creating the friction and creating the problems. And your opponent has to decide, like, okay, I've got to deal with these little poisonous guys. I also need to take care of the source, too, or this is going to continue to be a problem in future turns. So it just shifts it in the perfect direction to make a poison six drop relevant and interesting. Now, I'm still not sure the power level on this card is super high. It seems like you could just remove Shelob and maybe you just have to deal with one poisonous and it's not a lot for six mana, but I think it's such a good design twist. And I think the power level is still almost there. Like seven health's a lot to deal with on turn six. So getting a couple poisonous minions out of that isn't insane. Also just having a healthy beast around for Hunter can work well. So I could see this making the cut in some Highlander decks. It's probably not high pressure enough really, but it's a possibility. Nonetheless, it feels very much like a real Hearthstone card. Like this could be in the game today. It would not shock me at all. And it just reinterprets something in a very, very cool way. So next up here, let's take a look at Talion the Bright Lord. I gotta be honest, I'm not really familiar with Talion from Lord of the Rings, but hey, that's okay. We all learned something. This is Tastiest Cakes card. It's a 20 mana priest minion at 6-7. And its effect is pretty nuts. It costs one less for each friendly minion destroyed. Now, note that word destroyed. And if you get it down to a playable cost, the battle cry allows you to take control of all enemy minions. So it is basically a board-wide mind control, which is, needless to say, incredibly, insanely powerful. You get a 6-7, you take control of all your opponent's stuff. So it's like the swingiest card that would ever have existed in Hearthstone to a terrifying degree. And if you're interpreting this card differently than me, you might think it's really, really OP. You might be, oh my God, Regis, it's not that hard to kill your own minions. This thing gets discounted to five mana because you only got to kill 15 things. Just play a token deck, micro tech controllers, etc., 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 And this card's like game winning instantly at five mana. And I hear you, but like I said, I don't think this is just minions that have died. If you look carefully at the wording of cards like Corridor Creeper, for instance, it says for minions that have died, it gets a discount. This is for minions that have been destroyed. Now, I don't know if Tastiest Cakes 
intended this interpretation or not, but destroyed is slightly different than died. And I even read up on this in the Hearthstone Wiki. This is debatable, I'll admit, because there are destroy effects in Hearthstone that are unique from things being killed with damage, but I think there is still an argument to be made that things killed with damage are destroyed. But I'm interpreting destroyed very strictly here. In other words, minions have to be killed from a card that says destroy. So Twisting Nether, for instance, destroys things instead of killing them with damage, unlike Flame Strike which kills them with damage. So if your opponent twisting nethered your board of seven things, I think Talion would be discounted by seven. If they flame strike your board of seven things, Talion, I'm saying, would not be discounted at all because they would die from damage. Now, Priest also has their own cards that can destroy things. Shadow Word Pain, Shadow Word Death, uh, Plague of Death. Those are all destroy style effects. So I'm saying some combination of your opponent's destroy cards, like kind of universal removal, and some combination of your destroy cards would reduce this to a level where it's playable. So you'd have to probably support it by killing some of your own minions off in some way or another. Otherwise, you'd have to rely on Plague of Flames out there, Twisting Nethers, etc. to kill your stuff. So I'm saying it's much harder to discount this than you might think, at least based on my interpretation. Obviously, I want to hear your interpretations too. And in that case, I think this card's far more balanced because it takes some effort from your opponent, some manipulation from yourself, to actually get it to that level, which means you give your opponent a little bit more control, a little bit more influence over how this works, and also it really restructures how you might build a deck to support Talion. So you're really limiting how quickly and how regularly across multiple games this card can work, which I think is what keeps it balanced despite this really cool bonkers big effect. Next up here, we have another version of Treebeard, this time from the Golfer, another one that's a little late to the party here. It's an 8-man 8-8 that starts dormant, and uh, in three turns, it awakens and fills the board with 8-8 Treants. So basically, you would get seven 8-8 minions on board, kind of like a Chef Nomi-style play, but uh, even bigger, and potentially even earlier in the game as well, but still pretty late in the game, and uh, you give your opponent a lot of time to do that. So unlike Chef Nomi, which is happening immediately when you play it, you get the 6-6 six, six Nomi itself, you get a lot of stuff happening right as you spin the mana, right? Nomi is there. Unfortunately for Treebeard, you're spending 8 mana, and nothing happens for a really, really long time. And I think that's the only reason this card is balanced. Like, yes, the payoff is really, really big, but don't forget, the Druid is basically passing an entire turn for eight mana and that's a very very big punish and will often lose them the game so even though the payoff is big the the price to pay is so enormous from a tempo standpoint that i think treebeard is perfectly fine like three turns is a long time for this to matter also keep in mind these treants would not have taunt so even when this happens you can't actually play any minions like to protect yourself from a board so basically your opponent gets um a free eight mana turn that you pass and also three additional turns to kill you in the meantime or set up some kind of lethal scenario or just overwhelm you with value in the meantime so i think that's kind of a perfect balance like awesome payoff super delayed again exactly what druid is about anyway like trying to play for late game scenarios setting up stuff for the future that feels exactly right for treebeard it also just captures treebeard like took a little while to get there but once they get there they start wreaking havoc and uh kind of save the day so um, I like this card. I, I can and certainly envision some problems with it, right? There are some concerns, certain things, even recruit style effects are kind of weird because this isn't on a battle cry. But nonetheless, I think it lands in a pretty good spot. I want to hear your thoughts. If you think it's still OP, if you think it should be four turns, five turns, if you think it should be 10 mana, if you think Treebird itself should have worse stats, if you think the minions should be five fives instead, share all of that below. Of course, I want to hear those thoughts, but I think this one hits a pretty good mark, but also just really captures Treebeard well, despite any kind of balance concerns. You guys know a I don't worry super, super hard about balance here. It's more about capturing really cool mechanics and really cool ideas, which I think this one does very nicely. And speaking of cool mechanics, here we've got Sting from Synth and Lasers, a 4-mana 3-3 rogue weapon that reads, whenever your opponent draws a minion, reveal it. And um, if you don't know Sting from Lord of the Rings, this is a weapon that would glow any time, I think, like orcs and goblins... Maybe even trolls were nearby, so it would kind of give you this idea of like, oh my god, enemies are coming, I'm scared. And uh, I think it's really cool here that this weapon also kind of glows and shows you what's coming from your opponent. Like, that captures it really nicely. Now, I want to I note something here. I think this card um, 
expresses something really cool about card design that a lot of people get wrong. A lot of people, when they designed this card, would have said, whenever your opponent draws an orc or goblin, reveal it. Because they want to capture the card or the, the mechanic or the story or the theme perfectly. They want to like capture it in every single detail and make it exactly true to what the thing is supposed to be. But Synth and Lasers, you realize, like, that wouldn't actually be all that good in Hearthstone. That'd be weird. Be way too narrow, too specific. So he, he kind of got the base idea of Sting and pulled it into Hearthstone and made it bigger and made it fit what the game is about. So instead of being super narrow-minded, he broadened it while still being kind of, kind of an homage or reference to the source material. And that's perfect. Like, make it fit Hearthstone while still being true to the roots of what the idea is about. Too many people go really, really narrow, really, really close. I saw so many One Rings, for instance, that tried to capture, like, every aspect of the ring. Like, they wanted it all. It was about stealth, and it was about, like, being spotted by your opponent. And it was just like, oh, my God, guys, limit it to one specific element of the thing. Capture that on the card perfectly, and that's going to be a good design. That's what Synth and Lasers did here with Sting. And I think this would be a cool weapon in the game, right? Like, just giving a little bit of reconnaissance. The stats in this weapon are solid, so it does a lot of things very well, both from a design standpoint, also from a Hearthstone gameplay standpoint. This is a cool card. All right, folks, there you go. That's it for the Lord of the Rings custom cards. Some pretty awesome designs in the video. Some pretty awesome designs that didn't make the video as well, to be frank, but that's how it's got to be. That said, I'm sure you're curious about the next custom card review. The next time around, I want you to do something uh, very specific here, and this is going to be a little bit hard to explain, but I want you to make me a minion with just absurd stats. I'm talking 30, 30 plus. I want it to be, well, it doesn't have to be, but it needs to have some kind of big, crazy stat. And, um, you know, so think about like High Keeper Raw is a 20, 20, right? The Ancient One's a 30, 30. The Darkness is a 20, 20. Thinking that, maybe even bigger. Maybe it's a 100, 100. Maybe it's a 30, 30. Maybe it's a 50, 50. I don't know. I just want it to be like an enormous scale. I'm talking like it's just big, crazy minion. It can be a token off of another card. It can be a minion itself. Maybe it's a 100-100 that loses stats when something happens, right? Kind of like a giant, but stats instead of mana cost. I don't know what it's going to be. That's for you to figure out. I just want it to be big, huge, of some enormous scale. So make it a Titan. Make it Sargeras. Make it some kind of super giant, some big mechanical machination. I don't care. Just make it big. It doesn't have to be a minion itself. Something that gives you a big minion. It is a big minion. It's a weapon that summons a minion. I don't care. Just make it big. That's the goal this time around. That said, I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, thanks much for watching, guys. If you do like these sorts of things, hit the subscribe button. My God, I got to get to 100,000 someday. That's the goal. So uh, you'll be uh, ready to get notified when the next one comes out to all these fun custom card videos. But uh, until then, long way away probably, but until then, thanks much for watching. And uh, until next time, game on. 